Like two giants trapped in a dance in the dark, in the late 1950s, the undeclared conflict of the Cold War was in full swing. The Soviet Union and the United States led a contest between two ways of understanding the world. A silent confrontation, a political, technological, and economic dispute whose seed, planted after the end of the Second World War, had fully germinated. The officially named Union of Soviet Socialist Republics had become a world superpower in which the state controlled education and the media to extol the achievements of socialism, promoting the ideology of the Communist Party. To ensure a highly skilled workforce, to create a generation that supported the economic and political goals of the state, higher education offered great opportunities to all those who had big dreams for the future. In this context, the Ural State Technical University emerged as one of the most important educational institutions in the state, a whole generation of scientists and engineers who were destined to be the leaders of the new world. Among them, a 21-year-old named Yuri Yudin, a hiking enthusiast eager to explore the natural landscapes of the state, to test his skills in places that represented a challenge for survival. With contacts at the university, with other mountaineers, in January 1959, he received news that a radio engineering student, a 22-year-old named Igor Dyatlov, was organizing an expedition through the Ural Mountains, the natural border between Europe and Asia. Dyatlov wanted to make a trek to the top of Gora Otorten, a 1,200-meter high mountain, whose route to it was considered extremely difficult in mountaineering. The expedition represented a challenge, a feat that only prepared and experienced individuals could face. However, Dyatlov's proposal was so exciting that it convinced not only Yudin but eight more students and graduates. They were going to embark on a journey to obtain the most prestigious hiking certificate in the Soviet Union. Thus, on the morning of January 23, 1959, the group of ten people, led by Dyatlov, took a train from the city of Yekaterinburg to Serov, from where they traveled by truck to the small community of Vijay, the last inhabited settlement they would be in before plunging into the icy heart of nature. On the 27th, they began the march to the mountain. Amidst that silent cold, in a place where humans should not survive, they all found their place. However, just a day later, the community fractured. Yudin, who had a previous back injury, began to feel a lot of pain. Knowing that he could slow down his companions, and that any mishap in those conditions could pose a danger to life. Not without deep regret for the opportunity he was losing, he decided to leave the group and return. Dyatlov, lamenting his friend's departure, told him they would send him a telegram when they returned from the expedition. He believed the trip would take about 16 days, but a few extra days were possible due to the unpredictable mountain weather. Trusting him, Yudin returned home, waiting for the moment to see them again. The nine ventured into the place where the winds moan and the shadows lengthen in an endless night. Days pass amidst tense calm. February 12th, the day they should receive the telegram from the group, arrives without news from any of the nine. But what seemed like a simple and even expected delay escalates day by day into deep concern. By the 20th, Yudin's desperation and that of the relatives and friends of the nine hikers is such that they inform the authorities. They should have made contact a week earlier. With all the pain it caused them, they reported the disappearance of their loved ones. Aware of the conditions they could be facing if lost in the Siberian taiga, a rescue team moves to the region following the route Yudin had provided them. Day by day, all they find is a snow desert. No trace of any form of life. Until the 26th, something emerges before them. On the slope of a mountain, they locate what appears to be their campsite, the tent of the nine missing in the middle of nowhere. 
everyone has the same feeling. Something horrible has happened in that place. The tent, covered in a thin layer of snow, contains all the belongings, all the equipment of the hikers. Their boots, their coats, everything is neatly stored inside, but there is no trace of them. And above all, the tent fabric has been torn, slashed with a knife not from the outside, from the inside. Something had made them flee into the icy snow, with temperatures dropping to 30 degrees below zero, leaving everything behind, as if they had fled from something or someone. Whatever had happened, with nothing to protect themselves from the cold, the only fate awaiting them had been death. The young people had camped on the slope of the mountain Kolat Siakil, whose name, translated from the Mansi language, the indigenous tribe inhabiting the region, meant Mountain of Death. Legends of the people told that nine hunters got lost in the forests near the mountain and were found dead days later. The Mansi feared the mountain. They considered it a cursed place inhabited by wandering souls lying in wait for those who dared to tread into the realm of the dead. And as a sign of destiny, all those dark intuitions materialized. The boundary between reality and fiction blurred amidst the whispers of the mountain. The next day, nine pairs of footprints were found on the snow about 50 meters from the tent. The trail led to the forest resting at the foot of the slope, and judging by the appearance, all had descended with nothing but socks. But what truly broke the mold was that there were no signs they had rushed down. There was no evidence of panic or haste. Everyone had walked calmly, in a single file. The trail could be followed for about 500 meters until the footprints vanished in the snow. But everything indicated that they had reached the forest, 1.5 kilometers from the tent. And in it, right at the border, under a cedar, they found the remnants of what seemed to be an attempt at a bonfire. And upon inspecting the tree more closely, they saw evidence that someone had tried to climb it, with marks on the bark reaching up to 5 meters high. And finally, all the worst omens materialized. Near the cedar, they found the first two bodies. The corpse of Yuri Doroshenko, a 21-year-old radio engineering student, was found face down in the snow wearing only a short sleeve shirt, shorts and socks. His body bore scratches and bruises, and his ears, nose and lips were covered in blood. Presumably self-inflicted wounds born out of desperation as he froze to death. Beside him lay the body of Yuri Krivonyshenko, a 23-year-old construction and hydraulic engineering student. Once again, the young man had died practically naked. Inside his mouth was found a piece of his own thumb, torn off again out of desperation. Both young men had burns on their lower limbs, and their socks were burned. The logical conclusion was that, desperate from the cold, they had put their feet into the fire they had improvised. Analysis of the scene revealed indications that the two bodies had been moved post-mortem, perhaps by other survivors, to remove their clothing and attempt to survive in the icy hell. That same day, aware that all hopes had vanished, the team found two more bodies. On the slope and halfway between the forest and the tent, as if they had died trying to return to the campsite, they came across the next corpses. The third body found was that of Igor Dyatlov, the expedition leader and a 23-year-old radio engineering student. He had cuts and bruises on his face, and upon inspecting his dentition, it was apparent that he was missing an incisor. Once again, there were indications that his body had been moved post-mortem. The fourth body, the first of the two women on the expedition, was that of Zinaida Kolmogorova, a 22-year-old radio engineering student. She was better dressed than the previous ones, but her body bore bruises consistent with having been beaten. At every moment, the case seemed stranger. 
more questions arose in their minds, and the origin of their death appeared more terrifying. It would take another week to find the fifth corpse. The body of Rustam Slobodin, a 23-year-old graduate in mechanical engineering, was found on March 5th, halfway between the locations of Dyatlov and Kolmogorova. He had internal hemorrhages on both temples, and a large bone fracture in the skull, whose causes they were unable to decipher. The rescue team continued tirelessly patrolling the area to find the last four. But the days passed, and they seemed to have vanished, engulfed by the cursed mountain. As they tried to piece together the increasingly convoluted puzzle, that blank canvas silenced all their hopes. It wasn't until two months later, as they began to consider withdrawing from the area, that a member of the Mansi tribe, displaced to assist in the search efforts, discovered a sort of snow cave about 60 meters from the cedar, a pit that the last survivors could have dug to survive in that hell. And there, buried under four meters of snow at the bottom of a small hill, they found the last four. At that moment, the already incoherent investigation took a much darker turn. For the first time, and unlike the rest of the group, three of the four found had experienced severe internal traumas that doctors quickly described as the equivalent of being hit by a car. The body of Lyudmila Dubinina, a 20-year-old industrial economics student, and the second and last woman on the expedition, was found on the edge of a stream. She had ten broken ribs, and her heart had suffered a massive internal hemorrhage. But what froze their blood was that both eye sockets were empty. They had gouged out both of her eyes, just like her tongue. It was not at the scene. Something or someone had cut it off. The body of Semyon Zolotaryov, a 38-year-old guide and hiking instructor and World War II veteran, the oldest of the group, also had severe internal trauma in the thoracic area. But like Dubinina, there were no external bruises at the site of the presumed impact. Something inexplicable seeing that the traumas occurred when they were still alive. Once again, both eye sockets were empty. Alexander Kolovatov, a 24-year-old nuclear physics student, was found near the other two. His nose was broken and his neck was deformed, as if it had been broken. A strange cut was found behind his ear. This last group was leading the investigation down a dark path. A path of shadows whose end they did not know. Finally, they found the ninth and last body. Nikolai Thibault Brignols, a 23-year-old civil construction engineering graduate, was found with a massive fracture in his skull across the entire left side of his head. Only a massive force could have caused such an injury. They had found the Nine. Their families had bodies to mourn and bury. But the investigation had barely begun. Each and every death was suspicious. Internally, the case was causing great concern. The already dubbed Dyatlov Pass incident had everything to generate a media storm that the Soviet government could not afford. The orders were clear. Everything had to be kept secret. No one, neither inside nor outside the state, could know what had happened on the mountain of death. Days later, while autopsies were being conducted, news came that something strange had been found on the hiker's clothing. Three garments were radioactive. Dubinina's sweater and Kolovatov's sweater and pants gave abnormally high radiation readings. There was not a single explanation as to why the clothing of two students would be radioactive. Another piece in that puzzle that they knew they would not be able to complete. The higher-ups only wanted to determine if homicide could be behind the nine deaths. And despite leaving too many doors open, when the autopsies concluded that their injuries could not have been inflicted by a person, 
the Soviet authorities wanted to hide everything under the shadows. As early as May 28th, three days after the hiker's burial, Lev Ivanov, the chief investigator, concluded the report by stating that the nine had been victims of, quoting directly, an unknown compelling force. The case was closed, and all documentation was kept in secret archives. The families did not receive the answers they needed. No one explained to them what had happened on that mountain. Not a single news story in the newspapers or on the radio. The Soviet government had silenced everything related to the incident. The questions remained unanswered. The mountain kept its secrets, waiting for us to return to it and reconstruct the dark history of the Dyatlov Pass. Plagued by structural problems throughout the 1980s, the Soviet economy experienced a profound stagnation that led to growing dissatisfaction among the population. The legitimacy of the communist regime gradually eroded to a point of no return. Aware of the threat of economic collapse in the Soviet Union, the leaders of Russia, Ukraine and Belarus, three of the communist republics, gathered in the Belovetskaya Pushcha National Park to sign the treaty that would mark the beginning of a new era for the world. On December 8, 1991, the three presidents signed the agreement for the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Officially, the world's largest communist state had fallen, and with it secret files that the regime had hidden finally came to light. Among them were some that many had been waiting for for over 30 years. With the fall of the Soviet Union, the documents of the Dyatlov Pass incident became public domain. The story of nine hikers dying under strange circumstances on the infamous Mountain of the Dead, coupled with the opaque and rushed Soviet investigation that closed the case without resolving doubts surrounding their deaths, made the incident a media phenomenon. Quickly, the details of the investigation, with documents dating back to that winter of 1959, spread through national and international media at a dizzying pace. The narrative had all the ingredients to turn the incident into a mass phenomenon. The formerly secret archives were now available to independent teams, eager to solve what was already considered one of the great mysteries of modern history. Nothing in the case made sense. It was as if the legend of the Mansi tribe which spoke of nine hunters killed by the spirits of the mountain, had come true. Experienced hikers slashing the tent fabric, their only shelter in the midst of a frozen hell, to calmly descend the mountainside in an orderly fashion. Barefoot, without equipment to protect themselves from the cold, practically naked in 30 degree below zero temperatures. Wounds and grotesque injuries officially attributed to an unknown force, and if that weren't enough, clothing emitting radiation. The popularity of the incident went global. A challenge for investigators, and an opportunity to bring peace to the victims' families, who had been denied it for three decades. It was time to find the answers. To decipher the truth of what happened on that mountain. One of the first theories that emerged was that the hikers were killed by members of the Mansi tribe for venturing into their lands. The Kolat Siakal, the Mountain of the Dead, was feared by the people. Perhaps out of fear that the spirits would awaken, they killed the Nine. And knowing those lands better than anyone, they tried to make it seem like the work of the cold. The murder theory would explain why they left the tent so quickly, slashing it with a knife from the inside. Perhaps they realized they were being attacked and desperate tried to flee from the Mansi. Once outside, they were forced to descend into the forest, hence the orderly line and calm descent. At first glance, it might make sense. But delving deeper, the hypothesis fell apart. 
the Mansi were precisely known for their hospitality towards outsiders, so much so that they actively participated in the search, and in fact it was one of them who found the last group of bodies. Moreover, the injuries couldn't be explained. The autopsy report made it clear that the injuries could not have been caused by a human. If this practically ruled out the theory, imagining that they were able to erase absolutely all their tracks from the snow, took the hypothesis into the realm of the most absolute speculation. The second theory to explain the reason for leaving the tent so quickly was perhaps the most obvious, the hypothesis of an avalanche. It wasn't uncommon to envision them being caught in an avalanche. After all, they were on the slope of a snowy mountain, and that movement of snow was a natural phenomenon that explained why they left the tent so quickly. However, many inconsistencies appeared. The theory didn't explain the origin of the severe injuries. The cause of death of avalanche victims is usually suffocation after being buried. That several suffered the internal traumas found in the autopsies left the avalanche hypothesis as a rational but insufficient attempt to explain what happened. Furthermore, in case they had been caught in an avalanche, it made no sense for them to descend in an orderly fashion and without running as the footprints revealed. The tent was intact, only with some snow from the natural accumulation during the days it was abandoned. An avalanche would have destroyed it and even buried it. Just analyzing the terrain results showed that the area with a very gentle slope was not prone to avalanches. The scenario, although reasonable, left too many gaps. With the avalanche hypothesis discarded, they had to find another path. Another natural force that could potentially explain the events was what is known as catabatic winds, a meteorological phenomenon in which wind descends rapidly from a higher to a lower elevation, reaching speeds that can exceed 100 kilometers per hour. During the night, as the temperature begins to drop, warm air cools and becomes denser, causing it to move downward along mountain slopes and giving rise to these catabatic winds that roar without warning. In the context of the Dyatlov incident, suddenly, and in the middle of the night, the tent would be in danger of being destroyed by the wind, prompting the immediate evacuation of the young hikers. This again explained why they abandoned the camp, and unlike the avalanche theory, it provided an answer to the intact tent without being buried by snow. However, once again, it failed to find the origin of the injuries and didn't fully explain why they descended in an orderly manner and without running into the forest, when theoretically with those catabatic winds, they should have been in a state of panic. Understanding that they wouldn't find the answers they needed in the forces of nature, that the weather couldn't be the only explanation, they saw it necessary to delve into the mind and the strange phenomena that could have affected their consciousness. Their deaths, or at least the reason why they were practically undressed, one of the great enigmas of the case, seemed to be explainable through what is known as paradoxical undressing, an uncommon phenomenon that occurs in cases of extreme hypothermia. The person, although in the situation they would need to stay warm, experiences a subjective sensation of heat due to the mental confusion caused by hypothermia. In extreme cold conditions, the peripheral nerves undergo a kind of paralysis that not only reduces tactile sensitivity, but can also suppress the perception of that extremely low temperature. The neurological system leads the brain to experience a sensation of warmth, as if it were in a scorching environment. Faced with this situation, the person may have the desire to undress in an attempt to cool down. This effect of the cold, along with possible hallucinations due to hypothermia that made them flee the tent from a non-existent threat, could explain why they were found with so little clothing. But upon closer inspection, there were too many things that didn't fit. The reconstruction of the scene showed that the last survivors took clothing from those who had already died, and next to the cedar where the first two bodies were found, there were remnants of a fire. Everything indicated that until the last moment, the hikers had tried to stay warm to stay alive. Furthermore, it didn't explain the injuries found on some of them, and believing that nine experienced mountaineers didn't know about this phenomenon 
and that they all experienced it simultaneously, was such a leap of faith that the theory of paradoxical undressing remained in limbo. Continuing to search the mind for an explanation, one hypothesis spoke of something called von Karman vortex street, a phenomenon that occurs when a fluid such as air flows around a solid object. At the pass where they were camped, this phenomenon could have occurred, producing a sound of very low frequency, an inaudible sound to the human ear, but one that is known can induce panic attacks in exposed individuals. Infrasound, although not audibly, can be detected by the body. Vibrational sensations that trigger involuntary physiological responses, blood pressure increases, heart rate skyrockets, and excitement of the autonomic nervous system can generate feelings of anxiety and, in extreme cases, panic. These von Karman vortices would explain the senseless decisions made by the hikers, victims of irrational paranoia. But again, it didn't provide an answer to the injuries and it was a hypothesis that once again presupposed that nine individuals, each with unique brains, responded in the same way with a panic attack to those infrasounds. Unable to find a scientific explanation, with the news and details of the incident spreading through a world aware that no research team had reached a logical conclusion, the door to speculation was wide open. Rational theories led to dead ends. And quickly, the Dyatlov Pass case plunged into the realm of the paranormal. Cameras and journals belonging to the group and detailing their daily lives before that fateful night were found in the tent. And among all the material, one particular photograph captured everyone's attention. Open to interpretation, a snapshot taken at some point before their disappearance showed something among the trees. Mansi folklore spoke of a forest spirit that Siberian oral tradition called Menk. A creature similar to the Yeti, the snowman, spoken of in other parts of the world. A being that began to be attributed to the deaths of the nine hikers. Those who believed in the existence of the Yeti relied on the photograph to assert that Dyatlov and his group were hunted by the monster. In their paranormal conception, the theory explained both the hasty flight from the tent and the serious injuries attributed at the time to an unknown force. However, if they were truly going to play that game, they had to explain why the footprints of no giant snowman were found. If they wanted to provide exceptional answers, they first had to provide exceptional evidence. And beyond old tales and a photograph, they had absolutely nothing. Even so, everything had spiraled out of their control, and it wasn't long before the second major paranormal theory emerged. As was customary in unexplained events, the culprits ended up being aliens. The Dyatlov Pass incident had become linked to the UFO phenomenon. On the night of the incident, there were reports in the region of strange lights in the sky, which some Mansi described as small luminous spheres. This was enough for stories about beings from another world to be behind it all. Simultaneously, in Semyon Zolotaryov's camera, the most experienced member of the group, a photograph was found that fueled all these speculations. The image seemed to capture some kind of light in the sky, and although it was made clear that his camera had suffered water damage, and what was revealed didn't necessarily portray reality, it was claimed that Zolotaryov had photographed a UFO. Ufologists asserted that the extraterrestrials made contact with the nine hikers, who couldn't escape despite trying. Once trapped, they induced a trance-like state that led them to commit inexplicable actions, including the calm descent down the slope, to eventually kill them and leave behind that radiation, originating from their ship, on the clothing of Dubinina and Kolevatov. But once again, extraordinary claims required extraordinary evidence. However, something did catch the team's attention. The reports of lights in the sky could open the door to a plausible hypothesis, rational enough to consider, and it was the implication of the Soviet government in the incident. A cover-up of the events that truly happened that night. 
We were in the heyday of the Cold War. The Soviet Union was in a race against the Western Bloc for the development of a new generation of weapons. Weapons with the potential to deter the world giants that were being tested in remote areas of Russia. Regions very similar to those of what would be dubbed the Dyatlov Pass. Perhaps the Soviets were conducting tests with new weapons technologies. Hence the lights reported in the sky and even the radiation on the clothing of two of the hikers. Maybe the military considered them to be spies and eliminated them, then pressuring for the case to be closed. Strangely, the report determined that six of them died from hypothermia, and only three from internal trauma, despite all of them losing their lives under strange circumstances. The KGB, the Soviet intelligence agency, prohibited access to the region for three years, and it wasn't until the dissolution of the Soviet Union itself that the files ceased to be secret. The inconsistencies in the documents and autopsies were so glaring that the hypothesis of intelligence service cover-up presented itself as a solid theory. The idea of more or less direct involvement of the Soviet army was plausible, but even so there were too many gaps. And even if they weren't involved, the negligence in handling the investigation had shattered all hopes of finding a way forward. Despite the efforts of dozens of independent teams, no one could offer the explanation that everyone yearned for. The families of the nine victims didn't find the peace they believed would finally come to them. The Dyatlov Pass incident seemed destined to plunge into ever deeper darkness to remain forever as an unresolved mystery. But fortunately, much later, we were able to find the light in the midst of darkness. Sixty years after the incident, that unknown compelling force remained the only official explanation for the death of the Nine Mountaineers. Since the archives became public, only speculations and conspiracy theories had attempted to solve the mystery surrounding it. However, as a result of decades of pressure from the victims' families seeking clearer explanations about the tragedy that had struck their lives in February 2019, and as an unprecedented measure, the investigative committee of the Russian Federation announced that it would officially reopen the investigation into the case 60 years after it was closed. They announced that they would use modern forensic methods and new technologies to examine additional evidence and review the conclusions of the original rushed investigation. They were promising to shed light on the exact circumstances that led to the young people's deaths providing the world with a more precise and scientifically grounded explanation. The reopening of the Dyatlov Pass incident case generated great anticipation and drew international attention, renewing interest in one of Russia's great unsolved mysteries. And although there were genuine hopes in them, in a short time they concluded the investigation with an avalanche as the cause of the incident a hypothesis that had already been shown in the 1990s to have too many gaps. An avalanche was inconsistent with the intact state of the tent, with the footprints indicating a calm descent down the slope, or with the wounds found on the bodies. There were also no indications that in the area, very unlikely for avalanches any had occurred that night. So much waiting for the authorities to provide something only to quiet the rumors. The case was closed again, and it was like returning to square one. If Russia didn't want to delve into the mystery, others had to. To write the final chapter in the Dyatlov Pass history. In the face of the committee's negligence, with a renewed interest in the case, and above all, with much more advanced technologies than those of the 1990s, the last moment when scientific efforts were made to reveal the truth, a team of researchers from the Federal Polytechnic School of Zurich developed the most exhaustive study of the case ever conducted. They had to piece together the scattered puzzle pieces from six decades ago. One by one, they had to find them a place. 
One of the most discussed elements of the case was the empty eye sockets and the missing tongue of one of the girls. But all of this had been exaggerated. These soft tissues are the most sensitive to post-mortem changes. Both Dubinina, found without a tongue and eyes, and Zolotaryov, found without eyes, were discovered at the bottom of a small hill, in contact with a stream of liquid water. Both had been in those conditions for two months before they were found, many weeks in which the combined effect of water and decomposition, possibly with the involvement of wild animals, could have caused those post-mortem changes. Another of the most discussed topics, which had fueled speculation about UFOs or secret military tests, was radiation. Three pieces of clothing found on the bodies of Dubinina and Kolevatov emitted slightly elevated levels of radiation. Under normal conditions, an area of 150 square centimeters should not exceed 5,000 disintegrations per minute, the unit of measurement that quantifies the radioactive activity of a sample. One article matched that limit and two exceeded it, with 5,600 and 9,900 disintegrations per minute. The initial investigation didn't report the origin of those radiation levels, but perhaps there was a simple and rational explanation for the mystery. Kolevatov, who carried two of the three radioactive garments, was a nuclear physics student and had been working at a facility developing nuclear materials for energy generation through nuclear fission. It wasn't unusual for his belongings to have those radiation measurements, but Dubinina's sweater was missing. The girl was a student of industrial construction economics. There was no connection to anything related to nuclear energy. They seemed to have reached a dead end, until some photographs revealed something. The sweater with which Dubinina was found wasn't hers. It belonged to Yuri Krivonyshenko, the second of the bodies found, who was discovered with very little clothing and with signs of having been undressed by other members desperate to warm up. That it belonged to that boy changed everything. On September 29, 1957, the Kishtim disaster occurred, the third worst nuclear incident in history. The storage tank for nuclear waste at the Mayak plant exploded due to overheating caused by a malfunction in the cooling system. A huge amount of radioactive material was released into the atmosphere, creating a radiation cloud that contaminated about 52,000 square kilometers of land. The southern regions of the Urals were affected by the incident, and more than 10,000 people were evacuated from the region. With the magnitude of the accident kept secret by the Soviet government, many volunteers participated, unaware of the invisible threat they were exposed to, in the cleanup efforts. And one of those people was precisely Yuri Krivonyshenko. Similarly, Kolovatov's contamination could be related to this nuclear accident rather than his work, as at the time of the disaster, he lived in a village within the contaminated zone. With that, the radiation mystery was closed. However, they still needed solutions to the two most important questions in the case. What led the young people to leave the tent as they did, slashing it from the inside, and what caused the internal injuries many of them presented? An unusual geological process, not considered until then, could provide the cohesion they needed. The scientists developed a model that simulated a strange type of avalanche that could have impacted the tent, something known as a delayed slab avalanche. A phenomenon that occurs when a heavy concentration of snow forms on a weaker, less concentrated layer. Without warning, even when conditions seem stable, when the accumulation reaches a critical mass, the bottom layer fails. That castle collapses, and all the accumulated snow rushes down, a mechanism that by digging into the slope to build the tent could have been accelerated. The strong winds that night could have attracted more snow to the cornice, leading to a devastating accumulation. It was only a matter of time before it collapsed, and at some point that night, the weak layer failed, and a tiny but robust avalanche fell on their tent. The impact of several kilograms of snow falling straight down from a certain height, as simulations showed, could cause the injuries they saw in those who were in the wrong place in the tent. 
a sharp impact that injured some and sparked fear in all. Although it was an isolated event, with no risk of a real avalanche in the darkness of the night, they may have thought an avalanche was coming, making the terrible decision to leave the tent and seek refuge in the woods. This in turn explained the calm and orderly descent. They weren't running because at least at that moment no avalanche was coming their way. However, with the strong winds, it was impossible to light a fire, and the first two, Doroshenko and Krivonyshenko, succumbed to the cold and died of hypothermia. The remaining seven, already aware that what had happened in the tent was an isolated phenomenon and that there was no avalanche, tried to return to the camp, taking the clothes of their two deceased friends. But in the midst of that icy hell, climbing the kilometer and a half that separated them from the tent up a steep slope sealed their fate. It was precisely on their return that Dyatlov, Kolmogorova and Slobodin lost their lives, victims of hypothermia. The last four, Dubinina, Zolotaryov, Kolevatov and Brignol, aware that they would not reach the tent alive, tried to build a shelter in the snow where they could try to stay warm and return to the camp with the first light of day. In that improvised shelter, they could have succeeded, but the whims of fate made them build it over an underground river. A flow of water that does not freeze in winter and digs a tunnel under the snow and ice. They chose the worst place of all. A deadly trap threw the hole under their feet. Unable to support their weight, the ground gave way. The shelter collapsed and the four fell into the underground river, buried under those four meters of snow where they were found. With that, they completed the reconstruction of that fateful night on the Mountain of the Dead. The team published their study with the hypothesis about the slab avalanche in nature in January 2021, demonstrating that although the explanation was not perfect, it was the most plausible hypothesis about what happened to the Nine at Dyatlov Pass. The article generated a great stir in the community. So long afterward, when there were practically no hopes left, someone had shed light on the mystery. The families finally had something to lean on. More than 60 years after the loss of their loved ones, they had found answers. The case can never be closed. There will always be unanswered questions. Because only the Nine know what really happened that night. Only they, those who perished in the place where the winds moan and the shadows lengthen in a never-ending night, know the true story.